Dear colleagues, thank you for joining us once again for round four of our OncoAlert roundtable discussions. The OncoAlert network has taken the decision to bring the scientific community a little closer together and share what we know about the COVID-19 pandemic, especially regarding our cancer patients and the danger our colleagues put themselves in treating those infected. It has been a month since our original roundtable where much was still unknown and we learned from the experiences of our Italian colleagues. Now that the pandemic has landed in all continents, we are taking a look at the problems facing us globally. We see where we are now and what we can do in the future. Although we realize that the problem has extended to too many places than the ones that we are gonna be focusing on today, such as the US, Europe, and Asia, we will cover the effects of the COVID-19 on places like Latin America and Africa in the coming roundtables. We apologize for not being able to cover everything in one session, but the problem is too big and our time too limited, but we thank you for your understanding. Our aim today is to deliver to the world the key points, oncologically speaking, on what we could do to help save lives and what we could do and what we should be focusing on as a worldwide oncology community. We have gathered together not only an international panel of colleagues, but rather a panel of key opinion leaders in oncology from all over the world in order to give you a better view of the COVID-19 situation worldwide. On this particular round table, we have the added honor to host presidents and board members of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the European Society for Medical Oncology, the European Oncology Nursing Society, the Oncology Nurses Society in the US, and an official representative of the Italian Association of Medical Oncology. Our delegates are all stakeholders and represents some of the countries with the most number of confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we'll discuss key issues that plague our countries during these hard times. They will give their opinions and recommendations as to how their countries and institutions are dealing with these issues, and in some cases, what their respective societies and associations are doing to help. Our esteemed guests at this round table are Professor Solange Peters, CHUB Switzerland, ESMA President, and head of medical oncology, Dr. Howard Skip Burris, Sarah Cannon, USA, ASCO president and chief medical officer, Professor Andres Cervantes, University of Valencia, Spain, ESMO president elect and head of medical oncology, Professor Andres Charlampos, Cyprus, EANS president, Dr. Darcy Burbash, director at large of the Oncology Nursing Society, USA. Professor Jean-Charles Soria, Gustavo C. Friends, General Director. Professor Tony Shari, Dana Farber, USA, Chief of GU Oncology. Professor Massimo Di Maio, University of Turin, Italy, and the Italian Oncology Association and Head of Medical Oncology. Professor Ravindran Kanesvaran, National Cancer Center of Singapore, Senior Consultant. Professor Chadi Nathan, University of South Carolina, Chairman of Precision Oncology Alliance. Engineer Janet Freeman Daly, Ross Wonders, USA, lung cancer patient and patient advocate and retired aerospace systems engineer. And we have coming Mark Lewis from Intermountain USA, Director of GI Oncology. We are your co-host, Dr. Felipe Adis of Brazil, and me, Dr. Gil Morgan of the United States, residing in Sweden. I will be moderating this discussion. Due to the size of this panel, this roundtable will be slightly different than the previous ones. We have chosen a set of questions that have come from colleagues globally, which the discussants have had the chance to look at several days before and have had a chance to prepare their responses. But the majority of the questions that discussants will have one minute maximum to answer before moving on to the next colleague unless allowed time is already indicated in the agenda. The moderator will be presenting each question and choosing the order the discussants will be answering. Felipe, anything to add? I just wanted to add that uh, it's been really a pleasure to have the opportunity to have that uh, a panel with such a uh, representative and important names in oncology. And I'm sure we'll have a lot to learn from you today. Thank you very much for being here. In that, let's begin. Our first question. In many countries, oncologies, 
Oncologists and oncology nurses are being asked to assist in non-cancer COVID-19 units. What are the biggest difficulties with this for oncologists? How can these be dealt with? How do you deal with logistics and human resource problems in hospitals that have been turned into COVID hospitals? And for this, Massimo will be speaking about the comparisons from the beginning of the pandemic in Italy and now, and the roles of national societies in an emergency. Massimo? Thank you, Jill. Uh, thanks for the question. This is a very big issue. Uh, as you know, um, we are experiencing a, a very large outbreak of uh, COVID-19 cases uh, in Italy, especially in the north of the country. I work in Turin, uh, in Piemonte region, and in Piemonte region, to date, uh, we have more than, uh, more or less 20,000 cases and uh, 2,000 people already dead for the disease. In uh, my hospital, Mauriziano Hospital, that is uh, in the center of Turin, we have four wards completely dedicated to COVID patients. That means more or less 120 patients. And uh, these wards have been suddenly opened in uh, the second half of, uh, of March. Uh, and uh, all the divisions of, of the hospital, including oncology, have been asked to contribute to the, to the personnel of, of those uh, wards. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, uh, there has been a problem of human resources uh, because uh, many doctors uh, and many nurses uh, have been infected. So the staff at work uh, was, uh, and is, uh, necessarily uh, reduced. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have 50% uh, of, uh, um, of uh, my collaborators in, in oncology that are uh, working in, uh, in these uh, COVID wards. And uh, this situation is similar in many hospitals uh, and many oncology units in Italy, uh, especially, of course, in regions that are facing uh, the highest number of cases and the highest uh, level of emergency in, in the north of the country, especially. This emergency is so exceptional that uh, uh, it was uh, our moral obligation to contribute uh, to the non-oncological activity of the, of the hospital. But uh, as you know, at the same time, it is our moral obligation to maintain the activity for uh, our uh, uh, patients with cancer. And so our national society, IOM, uh, Italian Association of Medical Oncology, uh, already on March 9, that means the same day of the national lockdown here in Italy, made an announcement uh, uh, to all Italian oncologists uh, expliciting that the emergency could have uh, important impact on, uh, on our oncological activity, not only due to the health risk, but also to logistical problems and uh, to the shortage of uh, human uh, resources. And uh, in that announcement, uh, uh, in addition to the postponement of follow-up visits, uh, the activation of uh, follow-up visits uh, via email or via telephone, our society stated that uh, in case of patients uh, uh, who are receiving active treatment, uh, it seemed appropriate to evaluate uh, case by case uh, the postponement uh, of the access uh, to the hospital, considering the relationship and the balance between the risks and the uh, and the benefits. And this was a way for reducing not only the risks for the personnel and for the patients, but also to trying to reduce the burden of activity for oncology units, uh, given the shortage in terms of uh, personnel and in terms of, uh, of resources. Thank you so much, Massimo. Uh, anybody have anything to, to add? Uh, Tony? I think we, you know, have learned from our European colleagues who experienced, you know, the peaks uh, earlier and we're adjusting. Um, in the U.S., at least where I work in Boston, it has not been uh, as dramatic as um, uh, New York. Uh, and we have just recently reached the 1,000 death. We are prepared. And I would say the thing here, both from us, not just physicians and nurses, but everyone involved in our uh, cancer center is um, communication. And actually it's hyper communication. We have several meetings by Zoom, you know, every day, both laterally, vertically and horizontally. And with all stakeholders, the situation is very fluid and change, you know, every day and sometimes every hour. So that's, we emphasize uh, on very, very much. And uh, things are going okay so far. We're trying to follow you know, national uh, guidelines and um, things change, you know, every day. Thank you, Tony. Andres? 
Uh, of course, um, Cyprus is a, is a smaller place and it has not been hit as uh, largely as it has in Italy or uh, in Spain or the US, mainly due to the um, timely and very strict measures that have been taken. But from the nursing perspective, uh, there has been a strategic decision so that uh, cancer hospital, cancer specialist hospital are protected against the COVID. And so the decision was to prioritize any necessary shifting of nurses from uh, medical wards and surgical wards uh, instead of uh, cancer specific wards and cancer specific uh, hospitals. And this was um, a, a decision made basically to protect these hospitals from being um, contaminated uh, by, by the virus. And so far, uh, almost one month, uh, one and a half months since the first incident of COVID-19 in Cyprus, there has not been one case with cancer patients in Cyprus. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Jean Charles? Um, I um, would like to comment that uh, while in theory in uh, Paris the cancer centers were supposed to be COVID free, uh, the size of the wave, or I should say the tsunami, was such that very rapidly the other hospitals were overwhelmed. And therefore, we have a massive arrival of COVID patients, not only with cancer, also without cancer, into an ICU and our uh, classical wards. Uh, we have 90 beds of our 400 hospital that is a cancer center currently occupied by COVID patients. And one of the key elements in preparing for that was training the nurses, all the nurses, whether are surgical nurses or classical medicine hematology nurses about how to deal with COVID patients. That was a key element. Thank you, Jean-Charles. Uh, Darcy? Hi everyone. Um, in the states, you know, since we're such you know a large and diverse uh, population, there is uh, many different you know resources that are available put together by the Oncology Nursing Society in, to address being um, staffed. Um, similar to what Andreas had mentioned, what we're doing is you know closing the oncology units and you know keeping the patients as much as possible together and you know the staff is rotating between the ambulatory setting as well as the inpatient setting to help if there's like oncologic patients that need ports access or if the census is low in the ambulatory setting if we're you know reducing the amounts of visits that are happening and we're sending the nursing staff over there we really are, are trying to um, keep as much distance between the immunocompromised patients and the staff going to different units as much as possible so we don't have that um, cross uh, between patients that you know uh, would possibly be infected so we're doing the best we can with um, what we have depending on where we are practicing in the state. Thank you Doris. Solange? the observation or the probability of seeing, of observing a, a benefit or an advantage in countries or in hospitals, whereas there's a strict difference and separation between the cancer care and, and the other services. And maybe cancer, cancer centers might be a little easier to protect from the COVID infection. But to me, everything is more or less uh, about timing of the reaction. And what is very important is to really keep in mind how this timing can be wonderfully affecting the outcome. And to take an example, you can look at the Korean. Our colleagues knew what would happen and they took the measures, all the measures very fast and efficiently. And in the cancer centers, they didn't meet a single case of COVID positive patients. And in some other places, of course, because it's a learning process and unfortunately we have to learn, we did react too late. And I remember our infectiologists looking through the theory of an epidemic with the first phase of identification, the second phase of containment, trying to identify every contact, and the third phase of only protected, protecting the most uh, vulnerable. I must say in Switzerland, since the theory, we immediately jumped into the third phase of the epidemic. So suddenly the whole hospital was called dirty 
it was too late to divide into two teams. No team was clean. So the only thing, and we will discuss it later on, to try to protect the cancer center or the cancer service was really to put geographical barrier and try to, again, minimize the exposure of patients to the virus. But I think if it has to happen again, we'll learn how to react early enough that a really clean place can be secured for cancer patients and fragile people uh, in every place you are. It was just too late for us. Thank you so much. Ravi? Yeah, this, um, so being uh, the only Asian person here, I think um, one of the things was we were hit early. Um, in fact, in January, we had already stopped uh, flights from Hubei and Wuhan. And I think the thing that helped us most was probably the fact that um, we had experience from SARS in 2002, 2003. And, and since then, we've kind of prepared ourselves that this may happen again. So once things came into motion, we kind of made a fortress around our cancer centers. And to date, it's just a handful of patients who have cancer who actually uh, caught COVID. Um, so preparation was important. And like what Solange mentioned, because we had that hit start, um, we are still in the containment phase. So we're not at mitigation. We still do contact tracing. We still you know, make links between uh, patients and, and contain the situation. So it's not widespread in the community. Although in the last few days, we've had some issues with the migrant population, but they, they stay in separate areas within dormitories. So um, overall, I think we're we are still having pretty good control over the issue and cancer patients, for now, touch wood, things are okay, but we're prepared for waves to come. So let's hope for the best. Thank you, Ravi. And with that, we can move on to our second question. And that is, what are the therapeutic measures to prevent patients from moving into the ICU? And in the case the patient moves into the ICU, what are the key operational challenges of COVID patients in the ICU? And for this, we will ask uh, John Charles to uh, answer first. Sure, thank you. Preventing in patients with symptomatic infection to SARS-CoV-2 from moving to the ICU is, I think, a cornerstone of their management. Uh, we know there is uh, protracted ICU stays for patients with COVID-19 with a very high morning mortality. So everything has to be done to try to avoid patients to get into the ICU. On top of that, we know that the, the healthcare systems dealing with this pandemic uh, have to face extreme pressure on term of critical care hospital beds. In my opinion, and of course, uh, this is uh, just my opinion because uh, no therapies have been shown formally to be effective today with clear certainty and we do not have any randomized clinical trials. But in my opinion, in patients upstream of ICU when they are symptomatic, we have four uh, pillars. One is antiviral drugs to try to decrease the viral load. And I think the most promising therapy in that setting is remdesivir, uh, which uh, has clear potent in vitro activity, and there is a New England publication suggesting it might have promise there. I think we have um, lopinavir ritonavir with uh, a negative randomized trial in the New England, and we have hydroxychloroquine, which has clearly uh, preclinical activity. It can block viral entry. It has immunomoderatory effects, uh, but we don't have high quality evidence. That's the first pillar, antiviral drugs. The second pillar is antibiotics. Uh, many teams use hydroxychloroquine in combination with azithromycin, and I think uh, um, other antibiotics can also be cons uh, considered, such as cephalosporins or other macrolides. The third pillar that I think is extremely important is anticoagulation. Um, any cancer patient uh, should get enoxaparin, in our opinion, when they have COVID. And the fourth pillar is anti-inflammatory approaches with uh, patients who have very inflammatory disease with high CRP, high fibrinogen. Um, monoclonal antibodies against ILCs could be an option. Um, and even corticosteroids, in our experience, uh, could be another option. If I have 30 seconds for the ICU, I, I would say that um, uh, the major challenge once a patient gets in ICU is uh, uh, staffing equipment and resources. It needs such a high uh, quantity of staff and resources that is very important. The respiratory distress um, is the dominant clinical feature, but it's clear that the arterial hypoxemia 
greatly exceeds uh, abnormalities in pulmonary mechanism. We uh, do not have with COVID-19 the classical and typical IRDS. I think intubation should be postponed as much as possible. Uh, and um, we need to um, try to push for non-invasive methods of respiratory treatment, uh, including oxygen via high flow nasal cannula, continuous positive air pressure. And uh, the decision to intubate uh, should be taken only in patients with true respiratory distress. Um, finally, um, frequently these patients can have renal failure and in 20 to 30% of them you will need hemodialysis. And remember that once a patient is in ICU, there are numerous situations where infections uh, come as uh, the key element, nosocomial pneumonia uh, and even catheter-related bacteremia have been observed. We have patients who are in a state which is a major neutrophilic stunning, a very unique situation. Thank you, John Charles. Uh, next, uh, Shadi. Yeah, th thanks, Gil and, uh, and others. Um, maybe I, my take is I'd like maybe to offer a word of caution, actually. I, I, I think um, all what has been mentioned is um, obviously viable. Uh, there's no question that we all would like to have an effective therapy. But I'd like us maybe to take a, take a step back and, and realize that today, as we speak, we really have no known standard of care that we can say it is absolutely effective against COVID-19. So I think those are all thoughts. I think they should be discussed and studied in clinical trials. But I don't think we have evidence that hydroxychloroquine or Remdesivir um, is really um, going to benefit patients. So as long as patients are aware that of the adverse events, the side effects, the toxicities, and they are getting treatment that may not actually help and could potentially pose some harm, that's fine. Uh, I believe we have a lot of patients, unfortunately, that do have this illness, that clinical trials remain the best option to answer these questions. Um, unfortunately, we are dealing with, with a major pandemic, and we owe it to our patients <clears throat> if we have wave two and wave three to have enough information to tell a patient whether something works or not. So I, my take is, on this is that I would encourage enrolling all patients that are um, diagnosed with this illness into clinical trials um, that um, are exploring uh, potential therapies uh, so we can answer these questions definitively and once for all. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Solange? paradigms and discussion. It's, a, it's quite an interesting time because um, we are exposed again uh, to this uh, need for justification as oncologists about what we do for our patients uh, at the time where uh, you need to discuss with the colleagues for some of them to go into intensive care. We are all used to do that and to try to explain why we give this chemo and what are the aims of our treatment as oncologists. It has never been an easy discussion, but I think facing the lack of ICU capacities, the lack of beds and uh, some healthcare systems which are completely overloaded by patients, we suddenly sit again in the old days as a chair where we have to justify that some cancer patients, despite the fact they have cancer, despite the fact sometimes they have advanced disease, needs to have to be offered an ICU bed. And I must tell that um, doing all these registry efforts with the Americans, with the Europeans, uh, across diseases, what's really shocked me, and without revealing uh, uh, some data which will be published, but I was extremely surprised in my field is lung cancer, so that in lung cancer, the mortality looks to be 10 times uh, the mortality expected from COVID. Uh, and uh, the second question was to know, is it because they die from cancer? And what we observe mainly is that it looks like they really die from COVID. But the most surprising things was to see that most of them never went to ICU. So what is the barrier preventing the cancer patients very sick to be admitted in ICU? So here I think we need really to understand some countries have rules, even in Switzerland, under a life expectancy of a year, you should not send a patient in ICU if the ICU is quite full. 
if it's completely full, it's two years life expectancy and every country has fluctuating, changing over time rules for this kind of things. Last but not least, it's quite important to be rational anyway. For my lung cancer patients, what is the chance that after 14 days of intubation, some of them specific ones might recover from the intubation in ICU. So here you need to be very objective. But last but not least, as uh, the head of oncology, what I told to my colleagues from ICU is I want to discuss every single case with you. Because without this discussion, it means about doing subjective assessment of a disease which is not as deadly as before with the immunotherapy and the new paradigms. So I think the rule is please discuss with us. We'll be objective, promise, please discuss with us every single case. Thank you so much, Alonso. Tony? Yeah, I agree with most being said. I think just few. Uh, small things. We're learning and it's case report and there are now trials uh, ongoing and I agree totally with Shadi on clinical trials. But the prone position, so putting patient on their stomach and pathophysiologically it seems that it can open the lungs might help. Actually there is a French study from 2013 published in the journal uh, that dealt with ARDS that showed it, the prone position is associated with a lower um, mortality rate, I believe at 30 or 90 days. So folks have been trying to do that and seems the lung eye are aerated. And so perhaps that's something you can do before intubation. The other thing about intubation, I do not know personally if we should leave intubation at the end or support the patient you know, quickly uh, initially. <laughs> so that they don't get tired and it won't be a late intubation. A lot of it can be, you know, determined by, um, you know, uh, how many ventilators and others. And finally, I want to see, yes, again, agree with Shadi on clinical trials, but, you know, sometimes um, clinical trials, you know, are pretty hard, especially in uh, patients, you know, with severe uh, disease, especially without uh, comorbidities. And sometimes you have to try what you have to try. But what we're coming to realize is there are drugs that may work late in the course of the game and may treat, for example, the cytokine storm like the IL-6 inhibitor that Dr. Surya has mentioned. And there could be others that are better for prevention. So it's not like one drug for every type of uh, COVID-19. I think severity will play into action here. Thank you, Tony. Janet? Um, to build on what he was saying, there are a lot of different drugs being used in cancer patients. And in lung cancer, we have a lot of patients on TKIs, um, on immunotherapy, in addition to chemo. And we have absolutely no data as to how these prospective COVID treatments interact with those drugs. You can hold a TKI and get it cleared out of the system in a few days, but you can't get rid of chemo and immunotherapy so quickly. So I'm really hoping we'll get some data from some of these registries about how well these drugs work and the safety profile. Thank you, Jan. Uh, with that being said, then we close up the question and moving on to question three. What approaches could we take in order to decrease contamination for patients and also among hospital staff. And for this, I would like to ask uh, John Charles to start with uh, the approaches to decrease contamination among hospital staff. Sure, the potential risk of nosocomial transmission of SARS-CoV-2 generates great stress and anxiety among uh, healthcare workers. That's very obvious. Contact and airborne precautions uh, are, in my opinion, universally recommended, including uh, hand hygiene, but also permanent wearing of surgical face masks uh, for all activities, even when you're not in contact with COVID-positive patients. In many hospitals in France, including Gustave Roussis, masking has been extended to everyone, healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers, patients and anyone who comes with the patients, and we have shown very clearly that this decreased the rate of contamination in healthcare workers. In Gustave Roussy, where that measure has been implemented on March the 13th, the contamination rate of healthcare workers is only 3%. Other hospitals that were not applying that have uh, contamination rates up to 20%. I think in some healthcare-related activities that carry a very high risk of contamination, 
such as intubation, bronchoscopy, uh, suction of respiratory tract, or ENT surgery, then uh, you really need um, more uh, stringent personal protective equip equipment, including ground, FFP2 masks, and uh, pro protecting visors and glasses. Uh, we need to set up dedicated COVID conventional and intensive care units uh, that is very clear. Uh, and uh, air treatment in, in the rooms is very important, uh, especially in ICU. You absolutely need to have a negative pressure. Uh, any positive pressure should be strictly forbidden. Um, finally, I think repeated communication to all staff is very, very important about the ways of transmission. And even when you implement the masks, uh, we have realized that uh, taking meals together, thus taking the mask off, is the principal way of uh, cross-contamination of staff in, high, in our hospital right now. So uh, social distancing is important even during lunch breaks, which is not easy when you have spent hours together battling for those patients. Uh, human nature uh, is uh, to have a lunch together, but we need to make sure that it's not happening. Finally, Diagnostic testing is very, very important uh, of uh, healthcare workers that are in the dedicated COVID areas uh, for geriatric units, uh, for hematology, but in, uh, and for any patient that's going to have surgery, in our opinion. But of course, the ideal is to test everyone if you have the capacities. Thank you, Jean-Charles. Uh, Solange, uh, if you could talk to us about the approaches to decrease contamination risk for patients. Um, uh, one should uh, envisage opportunities uh, of reducing the contamination uh, risk for patients. But the first uh, two chapters, one is really structural, the structure you, you work in, and the other one is really uh, the treatment paradigm. So let's start with the structure. First of all, uh, you can control your clinical setting. Uh, of course, uh, there are some rules which have been written, try to limit to one point of entrance with triage stations, being sure that Everybody who enters is healthy with no history of fever, cough, or any specific symptom. Try that in your center every time, every minute, uh, respect the social distancing, including, of course, and it's not easy, the waiting rooms. Still in the structural changes, you can, of course, try to decrease the number of cancer care team uh, participating people in the same place in the same time. Not meaning they're not working, but we know how the crowds can sometimes characterize oncology care. So we have to be careful about it. And of course, in many hospitals, we have installed and uh, I would say addicted the, the rule of no visitors policy. So there's no one in the hospital, no one in the center who is not a patient or at maximum one accompanying person in case, in case of handicap. Of course, you can also uh, reduce the clinical visits, and I think it's part of the structural changes, uh, by doing some telemedicine, by trying to do the laboratory test between two treatments uh, at home or in a remote place, but not in the hospital. Of course, when I speak about reducing clinical visits, you can also yourself reconsider what you do in your center in terms of follow-up visit. Most of the follow-ups we have been doing in the recent years do not rely on evidence-based oncology. So you could imagine that sometimes some three months later controls or follow-ups might be simply delayed. About the treatment paradigm, this is way more complex because the most important or the worst things we could do uh, is to add a pure oncological mortality on the already well-known COVID mortality, just because it's simpler not to give a treatment or to reduce the treatment frequency. So we have to be very careful about it. Every system has its own limitation. This limitation will change over time, but as, as much as possible, uh, you must develop treatment plans according to the environment at every time point, and case by case, uh, uh, basing your discussion also with a discussion with the patients. The most important thing for us will be to identify who are the particularly vulnerable patients. And this patient might be the one who su suffer from or have to be, uh, I would say, imposed a limitation on treatments, being chemo and so on and so forth. But I'm still not sure we have fully identified 
who are the particularly vulnerable patients. On the other hand, of course, we have many options, surgery, radiation, chemo, targeted therapy. So again, according to the patient's situation and the environment, you might reschedule and prioritize differently surgery, radiation, chemo, uh, in order to try to prevent too many risks to your patient at each time point. But again, we have to be careful. Limiting treatment will have an impact on cancer outcome. We know it since, since decades. Thank you so much. Shadi? Yeah, thanks. Um, my comment is actually very brief, just about the masks and the recommendations that we get about um, what uh, healthcare workers should wear as they are in hospitals and caring for patients. I think, um, at least in the U.S., as these recommendations are being provided, uh, it's really critical to find this equipment to give to healthcare workers. I think it's one way to say you need to wear a mask at X, Y, and Z time, but if you don't really have access to that, it becomes an issue. Uh, so we, you know, I, I think we, we, we say always masks for all at every single time, and that's wonderful, but if I don't have access to that mask, frankly, all of these recommendations go out the window. So from the U.S. perspective, we have struggled in making recommendations and not realizing, you know, how do you actually apply these recommendations that you bring up. So I just want to leave this just food for thought because uh, I always pause about this. Uh, recommendations are great, but then how you apply it requires to have access to what you're telling people to, to do. Exactly. Andres? My comment is quite obvious and, and it relates to educating uh, healthcare staff about um, the use of uh, personal protective equipment throughout. And we shouldn't be forgetting that in some countries, people who already retired, uh, very young nurses were called uh, to manage this um, uh, epidemic uh, outbreak. Uh, so we have to bear in mind that we need to be educating our staff uh, on an ongoing process and have visible reminders throughout the hospitals and the units about maintaining that personal hygiene and uh, appropriate use of PPEs. Um, my other comment is that um, uh, from an organizational perspective in order to minimize contamination between healthcare professionals, um, we, we tested a handover procedure where this uh, takes place only between two people. And uh, so it minimizes uh, contaminations uh, between sheets. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Ravi? It's just to add on to what Andreas had mentioned um, with regards to healthcare workers. We in Singapore, what we do is we segregate inpatient and outpatient teams. So what this happens is sometimes the inpatient team will see, you know, tumor types that are not their area of specialty or even their colleagues' patients, and we even keep the officers separate as well. And one of the things I think we've been trying to highlight, especially to the junior doctors, is about how while we propagate social distancing among patients, even amongst um, healthcare workers, we need to maintain that discipline. We can't socialize with each other, eat lunches together. Everything is done separately in your own cubicles. And um, that sometimes is quite challenging. Recently in Tokyo, there were 12 interns that ended up with COVID because they all socialized together in their, their, you know, during the tea times. And so that's, that's uh, the point I wanted to make. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Tony? So I wanted to say, of course, in Boston at Dana Farber, the experience, you know, is similar. So everything um, from what was uh, captured. But I would add one thing um, not talked about is that out of the scratch, our hospital here under um, a project under the direction of um, our SVP of Operation Maria McDowell, out of nowhere, out of you know, from scratch, they were able to start a decontamination facility for N95 and uh, for uh, PAPR, the powered air purifier respirator, which can uh, purify out of a thousand N95 um, N respirators in two hours without you know, damage using hydrogen peroxide, I believe. And it just an announcement came a couple of days ago. So it's not just about getting the PPE, 
but at least uh, trying to preserve the PPE and clean it and decontaminate it in a very safe way to kill the virus and be safe to um, the healthcare worker. And uh, we had to learn that. We have great leadership at my hospital and we had to learn it from scratch. So we're all coming up with those uh, hidden uh, talents or um, absence of talents in my case, but that we're able to, um, you know, um, fight this virus. Thank you, Tony. And with that, we will uh, wrap up this question and we can move on to the next question. Uh, question four uh, will actually be answered by Jean-Charles and Robin first, uh, because uh, they, uh, it's uh, quite late and uh, they will uh, leave us. So we will pause after their answer to uh, thank them for being here and uh, for uh, taking the time to talk to us. So question four, what have we, been or what have been the current challenges of testing patients and staff in places like Singapore, for example, in April 11th, which had 875 active cases and seven deaths. What has been done there, and what is what is the big difference than what has been done in Europe? Uh, and for this, we can start off with uh, Robbie, who can talk to us about uh, the national containment strategy and its implication on oncology patients and preparation and early measures in screening patients at a cancer center. And then Jean-Charles will continue. Robbie? All right, thank you. Um, so I think you mentioned a, a very important point and I think everyone talks about it as well, is how much are you testing? And we need to test as much as possible. Um, I think currently our, our testing rates are on par with uh, countries like South Korea. So we are really getting a lot of tests done um, initially, it was via part of the containment strategy, but, but now I think uh, with more and more people having it, especially among the migrant workers, uh, there's a lot more testing done. Um, because our numbers are not too high yet, we are able to manage in terms of uh, intensive care, and that's how we've kept the mortality low. Uh, but cancer patients have always been regarded as very high risk. So, like I mentioned, since end January, uh, we have initiated a lot of the measures that, that a lot of you guys have mentioned. So there's screening at the entrance um, and patients who are high risk from nursing homes, community hospitals, they're not allowed in. Patients with, high, with any fever is not allowed in as well. We actually treat them in fever clinics outside of the center so they don't come in, um, in a sense, and, and risk contaminating you know, the staff and, and other patients as well. So, so testing is important. In terms of uh, healthcare workers, we do have healthcare workers that have uh, uh, got it, but it's usually through social circumstances. So fortunately, we've not had healthcare workers who got it through their job from COVID patients in the hospital. In terms of the cancer center, touch wood so far, we've not had a healthcare worker who's uh, got it as well. So I think so far we're still in the containment phase um, and um, we are hoping things will remain uh, the way it is. Thank you, Robin. Jean Charles? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, Jill. Um, I think um, the situation has been pretty challenging um, in France as in many other European countries, not all, um, but uh, we have had um, a delay in, uh, in testing massively, and I think that's a ma major uh, problem because in any infectious disease, uh, identifying who's an infectious case and taking him away of the system is the best way to stop spread of the disease. Uh, this has been done with some delays. In France, we were initially testing 3,000 um, cases uh, a day uh, versus 30,000 cases uh, in, in Germany. Right now, we are testing 30,000 cases when they are testing 80,000 cases. Um, RT-PCR on nasopharyngeal swabs uh, is now being generalized and uh, we are in our cancer center implementing it in a systematic manner now for every single patient and every single physician. This, uh, in, um, along with sero, sero conversion, will allow us to have a clear idea of the true prevalence of the disease in, in our population. Thank you, Jean-Charles. Uh, Janet? In, I'm in uh, Seattle, and we have the University of Washington here who developed a test early on. 
and just this last week they announced that they are going to be testing all admitted patients for COVID-19. And they're able to do this because they have a high throughput test and they can get the results back same day. Not everybody has that yet, but I'm very happy that it's starting to take hold. Thank you, Jan. Massimo? Yes, thanks. Um, in Italy, we have uh, a problem because we are not performing universal uh, tests uh, for uh, oncology patients uh, without symptoms. And also for staff without symptoms, uh, uh, we are not able to um, perform uh, massive testing. We have repeatedly asked for the massive testing also as a national society, especially for the staff. But uh, logistically, it is very difficult to perform tests for all operators in, uh, uh, in time. Consider that not a month ago, but just this week, uh, I waited uh, 24, 36 hours to obtain the result of the test for a couple of my colleagues. And at the moment, the system is testing only subjects with symptoms. So in Italy, uh, we have at the moment a big distance uh, between the theory and, uh, and the practice, unfortunately. Thank you, Massimo. Salaj? Beyond this, um, an interesting discussion, which is uh, kind of uh, looking at the future, is beyond this test, uh, looking for the acute infections, the swabs, the RT-PCR, which, uh, as we heard, is sometimes limited in, in the, how many patients and caregivers you can test. So next discussion will be about the serology. And in many countries, we start to be able to measure or anticipate the proportion of uh, patients, general population members or caregivers who have been infected in the past. Of course, it doesn't replace RT-PCR because there's a delay before you can measure IgM or IgG. But the next question is all the unknowns about serology too. How can you use uh, an IgG positive in terms of specificity, being sure that you can then take decisions out of it in terms of exposing, I don't know, a patient to autotransplant or a, a caregiver to COVID with a lower level of protection. So I think the, the next question is this serology test. And it's also about this, and I don't want to enter the debate because you can probably see on Twitter, it's more than a debate about what we call the herd immunity or the community immunity, meaning that at a certain time point, it might be possible that the virus stops circulating because enough people in the community uh, are immune. Uh, of course, it's a matter of debate because of Sweden also, who decided to base the whole strategy on that. So this serology test for me is really something arising many questions about equity, decision-making process, specificity and sensitivity of everything we look at. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to see how it develops and how we really make uh, the best use out of it in the future. Thank you so much. And with that, we can close uh, question four. And uh, we would like to thank uh, John Charles and we would like to thank Ravi for uh, being here, uh, for taking the time to participate in this uh, wonderful roundtable. They've had uh, amazing uh, insights and it's really a real privilege for us to uh, know uh, what their what their input is on uh, these specific issues so thank you very much john charles thanks, and robbie thanks Gil. thank you and thanks everyone um it's a pleasure bye-bye thank you bye-bye thank you thank you okay and with that being said we can uh, continue so moving on to question five when it comes to balancing contamination risk and cancer progression what considerations are your countries taking? How does it affect the treatment decision in oncology during these times? Once you have a positive patient, when do you take the decision to treatment? What measures are being taken to protect immunosuppressed patients who may still need to come in for treatment? How do you feel about the use of GCSF in patients receiving chemotherapy? In one hand, it could reduce neutropenic fever, but in the other, it might actually contribute to the cytokine storm that drives ARDS. What challenges, hurdles, are patients facing during these times while undergoing treatments? Solange? It's a, it's a complex question and we see here how many open questions we still have practicing oncology at the time of a pandemic. Uh, I think what we tried to do in ESMO, and I know ASCO did exactly the same, is to write guidelines. So trying to help our colleagues to potentially 
and depending, of course, if it is needed or not, but potentially adapt what we know being the standards of care, which uh, save life or prolong lives, to try to adapt them reasonably according to the potential needs of preserving patients from exposure and from side effects of what we do. So in every disease type and for any type of intervention from surgery to immunotherapy, we have been describing what can be done, minimizing the oncology impact, the oncological impact of the decision, but also on the other hand, reducing the risk for patients. GCSF is certainly one because what I have been seeing in the many patients, we now follow more than 300 patients with COVID and cancer in my small center. Uh, what I have been seeing is accumulating risk, having comorbidities, but the fibrin neutropenia uh, concomitants to COVID uh, has a very high rate of mortality. So I think, of course, the GCSF is a good idea, of course, and we all know the pharmacology of immunotherapy allows us to have larger interval, deciding or not to double the dose, you can decide. But I mean, there are some things you can do with, which have an impact, right? Uh, of course, because it's not standard of care, but a minimal impact. Uh, so we try to prioritize treatment decisions according to what you don't, you are not allowed to negotiate. We call high priority that you have to do now without any delay to a second category of middle uh, of mid priority, which is uh, about something which can wait for six to eight weeks without a major impact. And of course, also a series of things we do, which might wait until the end of the pandemic. And this might be uh, mainly about, uh, I would say, follow up and, and, and maybe screening for some patients. So it's quite important to try to use these guidelines, adapt them with the registries, which will help us to, to know if it's true and correct. Uh, and, and try to, to minimize uh, the gaps that you can have between your decision and the oncological outcome, the risk benefit. So there's one thing I haven't uh, quoted before is clinical trials. Uh, I'm quite sure that some clinical trials we were performing in the past will have to wait. And I have here in mind the phase one trial where it's difficult to justify a risk benefit ratio, uh, which sounds reasonable at the time of COVID but many other trials, and I think you need to balance this uh, in your own environment, might be questioned at the time of a pandemic. Thank you, Solange. Janet? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> um, so patients have a lot of concerns. We know, we kind of have an idea of what sort of risk we have if our cancer progresses, but there's very little data to tell a specific cancer patient what their true risk is of developing a severe case of COVID. So the Longevity Foundation recently conducted an informal online survey in the U.S. to collect Camp lung cancer patient concerns regarding treatment and clinical trials in the era of COVID. And of the patients polled, 14% had said already their doctor had postponed or canceled their cancer treatments. Um, some of their top uh, patients' top concerns, of course, is exposure to COVID-19, which is exacerbated, at least in the U.S., because all of the N95 masks are going to healthcare providers. So patients who have to go out to treatment um, have to improvise. Um, they're concerned, obviously, about their access to treatments and their medications. Um, we're trying to implement telehealth for those patients who can't travel to go to an appointment or who can't, whose doctor's hospital is trying to put off appointments. But not all patients have the equipment or the tech savvy to be able to do telehealth. Um, with regards to delays in treatment, um, patients have had brain MRIs and CTs postponed. Um, routine follow-ups are being put on hold. Um, they're concerned about delaying or changing their treatment. Um, some doctors are delaying their immunosuppressive or chemotherapy treatments until the curve has flattened more. Um, some are delaying or reevaluating radiation. Some are being told that they won't do anything more until a new progression occurs. <clears throat> Um, some of them are concerned that their hospital is no longer able to do clinical trial infusions because the risk is too high. And um, also to follow on what Solange was saying about research and clinical trials, there are patients who are worried about the impact of missing a clinical trial visit 
either for their infusion or for a checkup. Um, they're concerned that their trial will no longer continue and they won't be able to get a medication that might be their last option. I know a lot of patients who are progressing and they want a treatment then they've thought of going on a clinical trial, but that clinical trial is now no longer enrolling. Um, and then there's a general concern that most of the basic research has been shut down because they're in academic centers in areas where people are being told to work from home. So we're wondering about what's happening to the next cancer treatment since many of the over half lung cancer patients, for instance, are not curable. And many other metastatic cancer patients have similar concerns. Um, and of course, has been mentioned by a few people, there's a concern that if a cancer patient gets infected with COVID-19, are they going to be triaged away from care? In general, the cancer patient advocate community has also expressed concerns about the impact of COVID-19 on our work towards shared decision-making. A lot of these decisions are just being taken out of patients' hands. Um, if a patient goes to a facility different than their home hospital, can that new facility get access to their medical records? We don't have full interoperability and not everybody uses digital records worldwide. And some patient advocates have actually talked about developing an app that would allow patients to identify which nearby clinic or hospital has fewer COVID patients or is performing necessary procedures. Um, some hospitals in New York City now are no longer doing bronchoscopy, so you might have to travel to somewhere else. Thank you, Janet. Darcy? Thank you, and thank you, Janet, for your you know, great comments and Solange as well. I know in our uh, clinical practice, not only are we, you know, meeting virtually every day, uh, talking with each other, uh, weighing the risks and benefits of patients who are currently under treatment or who's scheduled to come in for treatment, also our multidisciplinary centers for patients who are newly diagnosed, we're holding them virtually as well. So, you know, there's a lot of um, things that we're trying to put in place for patients to maintain that shared decision making. And although the, the treatment regimens may be switched up if possible, for example, if surgery is on hold, if um, neoadjuvant therapy can be given safely up front, we're, you know, still continuing to do that. Um, we haven't had any COVID positive patients in our center with cancer. So, you know, but we do have protocols in place if somebody were to be diagnosed um, that we would, you know, if they were on treatment, you know, discuss with them about the benefits of continuing treatment and if it would be um, treating them at the end of the day with a, a team that's only responsible for providing that treatment. Uh, in radiation, we're really staggering the treatment schedules as well as the staffing schedules to keep them safe as well. And if someone were happened to be positive, we would treat them at the end of the day as well. Um, for the people that are on clinical trials, our clinical trial staff, they're also staggering the times that they are in and available and putting together what needs to be uh, done and continued to be you know, monitored so they don't take a protocol violation if that were to, to occur. And I think the other point that you know, as, as nurses is that we are restricting the visitors you know, in the ambulatory and in the inpatient setting as well. So just providing, you know, to the patient and letting them know that we're in this together, we're, we're all in it together, that we're not going to uh, leave them and we're still available to them. Um, if it's a phone call, if it's a, a telehealth visit, or if they're reaching out to us through the portal, just, you know, letting them know that, you know, we're, we're going to get through this together. So thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Tony? Yeah, so I, I think um, there's a lot of things we are doing at the local level and at the national, international level. At the local level, you know, I'm a genitourinary medical oncologist, so we, we're looking at all those patients with systemic treatment because a lot of the patients that, you know, are, are followed, many of them with scans, with PSA, with prostate cancer, we can delay that, but we don't want to miss the patient on systemic treatment. Imagine if you have a a metastatic testicular cancer patient who can be cured with BEP chemotherapy. We don't want to mess with that. On the other hand, the other part of the spectrum, patient on an immune checkpoint inhibitor, these are antibodies, they stay in the system for a long time. What happens that this patient is responding, is in complete response or a 
a deep partial response, that patient, let's say with kidney cancer or bladder cancer, we can extend the intervals. Of course, like Janet was saying, with a discussion with the patient. So what we developed at the Lang Center for GU Oncology is an idea that we took from the breast oncology group at Dana-Farber with Dr. Eric Weiner, uh, Rachel Friedman, and Ann Partridge, and we developed guidelines. We're finalizing them. What can we do in the time of COVID-19? What can we delay and not delay? You know, what things could we do at that level? And we're going to disseminate those guidelines and suggestions. Think about of it as more suggestions. So the luprolide injection every three months could be every four months. Uh, and when the chemotherapy cycles could be delayed, et cetera. And we're going to disseminate them to our uh, uh, oncology uh, network. On the international and national level, actually, uh, to do a quick research, beside the clinical trial that everyone talked about, Dr. Peters and uh, myself uh, are part of the COVID-19 and Cancer Consortium, which is a group of folks that get together, started initially by social media, and we're collecting information at our hospital after IB approval of a cancer patients that have COVID-19. What's their baseline characteristic? Come up with some risk factor, because for cancer patients, the risk factor may be different than the general population. What's their outcome? And we're up to a 1,000 patients. I think as of the last few days, both Dr. Peters and myself sit on the steering committee. So a lot of moving target at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Shadi? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think the, the only two comments I have is that um, uh, obviously this is not something that anybody was prepared for. Uh, this is not something that anyone really expected that's going to happen nor that anybody was aware of the magnitude of this. So um, it's important to recognize that a lot of these things that are being developed are opinions based on expertise. Uh, we can't really claim that these are really evidence-based and they don't need to be evidence-based. This is There's really not a lot of evidence that whatever we are doing is going not to impact patients' outcomes. Um, I think Tony brought a very good example for testicular cancer metastatic disease. There's no question we know that the outcome would be detrimental if we don't really uh, start therapy right away. But we don't know for other patients whether our current interventions and our suggestions and our guidelines are really going to hurt or benefit. Um, we are developing these guidelines on the fly based on what we think is right. So what you're going to see over the next couple of years is a plethora of real-world evidence studies and retrospective uh, analyses that look at whatever interventions we implemented and try to explore whether these interventions were good or bad. So again, to the example that Tony mentioned, you know, we'll go back and take a look whether delaying the scans on patients on checkpoint inhibitors uh, had any detrimental effect or not. And maybe if it didn't, we stopped doing frequent CAT scans. And that's actually a good thing, we, right? We save cost and we avoid patients getting on CAT scans. So I think I just want to make sure I'll provide a word of caution that these are not uh, black and white recommendations. These are um, guidelines, suggestions based on the best we could do, but we, it's going to take us time to know whether whatever we are implementing is truly helpful or maybe was not that helpful. Thank you, Charlie. So now uh, we close up that question and moving up to question six. There are certain countries seeing less mortality and less infection. We hope that things are starting to normalize there. So what is the next step once no new infections are achieved? There is talk about another wave of the virus in the fall. How can we, better be, can we be better prepared to handle this? Would keeping more distance as a norm, uh, such as video consultations and telemedicine, be a way to decrease the risk of infection to our vulnerable population when the second wave hits? Andres? So thank you very much, Jill. Uh, before expressing my, my uh, worries for the second wave, uh, I have to say that I'm uh, uh, really worried uh, by the work we are not doing now. So we, we, we know that many patients are not coming 
uh, to us because of uh, uh, several difficulties and uh, concern. So we are seeing less patients during these uh, uh, days, even less new patients. So uh, for medical oncologists, perhaps, and at least in my country, one of the issues could be the uh, increasing numbers in cancer patients we, we are going to to have, we have to, to take care of in the next uh, uh, a few weeks. And this could be a very important issue. But also I think uh, I would uh, 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 underline some uh, positive aspects of uh, this situation because we have been learning on uh, how to uh, make uh, things uh, um, easier and more feasible. For example, we are working quite a lot on uh, telemedicine. We have established uh, also a system to communicate among uh, ourselves, so every team should be very well connected, uh, having uh, daily meetings with uh, AIMS, we do that with uh, WebEx or other type of uh, electronic resources, and, uh, and uh, also we do the same way, uh, multidisciplinary uh, team meetings. So I think this is something uh, positive, that this is going to be prolonged, even the, the pandemic is, uh, is uh, uh, over. So I think those are some of the positive uh, aspects we have been learning during this uh, outbreak that can help us in doing better medicine in the future. Thank you, Andres. Tony? Yeah, I think a big part of that I would love it to stay is telemedicine and, uh, you know, telehealth. Uh, and I think, uh, at least in the U.S., um, it, how we deliver care is in large part, we can talk about, you know, all the data and the positive phase threes in oncology, but really in large part is how we are reimbursed. First by the government, biggest insurer, and second by private insurers. And uh, I think hopefully here they will realize that telemedicine is here, you know, to stay. And um, despite, I think, the fact that face-to-face -face is still very important, but there are a lot of advantages. And I hope, you know, it's here to stay and stay largely. The second thing is clinical trial. Clinical trials remain very, very rigid. Um, you know, monitoring that happens face-to-face -face with the PI, um, the patient that has to come every couple of weeks, even though they don't need to come. The fact that now we can ship even experimental drugs at home, other, other, hopefully this is will ease, you know, clinical trial uh, complexity. So patient can participate, you know, more and more with these clinical trials. So I'm seeing, I'm trying to see the silver lining here. The other part is, are we as a society outside because you know we're all in oncology here but at the same time we're part of a society where humans are things are changed are we going to start seeing um, uh, more and more the next you know couple of years especially with the younger generation uh, fist bumps rather than uh, handshakes you know um, what are we going to see is social distancing going to be the same thing etc especially in the short term like dr peters was uh, saying. I think being socially uh, distant, uh, I think even uh, the next, uh, uh, you know, wave of this happening will be very, very important. And we're getting more and more into that. Thank you, Tony. Shadi? Uh, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Maybe I'll comment uh, more on the, so, uh, on the um, impact on us as um, as people, I actually think that the longer this goes with what we are dealing with, with COVID-19, the behavioral changes that we are doing and we are experiencing are going to be long lasting. Um, I think that we're going to have a new norm. I really do. Um, and the new norm will have, will have an impact on the way we see patients and the way we conduct clinical trials, as well as on the way we um, deal with, with each other. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, people are gonna be comfortable flying unless they really have to. I, I think that um, um, you know, if you, if you have to go to a business meeting, people will think, well, do you need to fly five people versus just one person and the other folks will join by Zoom? Um, 
I don't think people are going to be comfortable shaking hands. It's very possible restaurants might change to have the tables far apart from each other, six feet apart. Airplanes maybe will get a little bit more leg room and they may let people a little bit far away from each other. But, but I, th I, I don't think we are going to have the same exact behavior that we had before and after. I go back to September 11, the unfortunate terrorist attack, and I remember when the airports was changing and everything um, was going on in terms of um, taking off your shoes in the U.S. And, and elsewhere, we were complaining, but that became the new norm. We just dealt with it, and that was really what we needed to do. And, and I think we are, we are uh, transforming into a new norm, and the longer this continues, that new norm will be established. I'll speak for myself that um, I'm not shaking Tony's hand. You know, I mean, he might try fist pump. I'm just going to do namaste. So it's just the way things are. And maybe it's going to take time when we have a vaccine, people start actually becoming uh, more comfortable. So I, I, I joke around a little bit with Tony about this, but the reality is we all know that there's some anxiety that uh, people are feeling. Patients are going to be uncomfortable. They will start calling in and say, do I really need to come for my six months follow-up? I feel fine. I'll just log on the Zoom and just say hi to you on, the, on Zoom. So uh, let's see what the next uh, year shows, but uh, I think our behavior as people is changing rapidly and some of this behavior is gonna stick around for a long time. I wanna say just the thing that Chadi maybe want a hug and perhaps a kiss. That's true. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Massimo? Uh, uh, yes, thanks, Jill. Uh, I'd like to spend one minute uh, uh, about uh, the role of patient reported outcomes, because also in Italy, we are realizing that uh, to optimize the patient's assistance during this uh, emergency, uh, but also after, uh, we should improve the use of telemedicine and uh, technology. Uh, I, I believe that the, this emergency uh, should speed up the use of electronic uh, Pros, electronic patient reported outcomes for clinical practice because also in Italy many apps have been uh, recently created and, uh, and validated based uh, on um, the different several instruments, several tools also in Italian language. And uh, um, the adoption of these instruments could have many advantages because firstly uh, with the electronic questionnaires checked by nurses and doctors and uh, uh, together with phone calls we can allow a systematic check and uh, man a prompt management of, uh, of symptoms, of side effects. Um, secondly, if we uh, obtain an early identification of worsening symptoms and toxicities, this could prevent the occurrence of uh, severe adverse events and uh, uh, ER access and uh, hospitalization. Uh, thirdly, uh, as I said before, during uh, as I said before uh, during this emergency, many cancer centers uh, um, have, are working with a reduced number of, uh, of personnel. So telemedicine could be performed uh, also by staff working at home, working remotely at home, for instance, by staff that are quarantined at home. And last uh, but not least, the adoption and discussion of patient reported outcomes would have a positive psychological impact on patients probably increasing their um, satisfaction with uh, our uh, healthcare service. Uh, I have discussed a lot with Italian colleagues and uh, we all believe that uh, as oncologists, uh, it is important to avoid that uh, our patients feel uh, abandoned and, uh, or neglected during this uh, uh, such difficult uh, period. Thank you, Massimo. Andreas? Great comments by all of my colleagues and uh, really I, I don't want to, to repeat any, any of those comments. I totally agree and um, my adding to this is that um, in the months to come there will be a wave, a massive wave of information into the literature from trials and, and published evidence. I, I think what we need to be doing is to actually implementing those data into practice. Otherwise, it will be remaining as just evidence. And um, COVID-19, eventually, if it's after two or three or 10 waves, it will go away. But what we need to be doing is to be placing ourselves in the right, in the right mind frame for the next epidemic 
that will happen and it will happen based uh, on the projections and the statistics. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Skip? Just a quick comment to echo those sentiments and uh, Tony and Chadi both alluded to the fact that we need to do what Ned Sharpless, head of the NCI, has talked about, which is modernize the clinical trial process. At Sarah Canna, we've been investing in remote data monitoring, electronic signatures, electronic regulatory folders, electronic consent, the e-consent process has been uh, very satisfying to the patients. And so, you know, this terrible tragedy, this pandemic might in fact accelerate using technology to simplify and minimize the travel and the, and the burdens for many of the trial patients. Thank you very much, Skip. Uh, Janet? I'd just like to emphasize that a lot of the changes that are being put in place for clinical trials in the era of COVID are doing a lot to make it easier for patients to participate in clinical trials. And I'm very hopeful that some of them, like telehealth uh, and uh, spacing out scans, will stay in place after this is over, if it's ever over. Thank you, Janet. 